Hey there, everybody. This is Jacob Campbell from Liegeverse, facebook.com slash Liegeverse. And we're pretty much the only English speaking community for Liege Matsumoto fans on Facebook. And we've been doing a fantastic series of interviews with all sorts of people who have worked with Liege Matsumoto or have uh, worked in the fan community. And today we're working with somebody who's actually taken a severely academic approach to documenting a lot of cool stuff about Liege. Matsumoto. They released over a dozen books, worked on Anime UK a magazine there, and just super excited to have such an awesome resource for information today. This is Helen McCarthy. How are you doing? I'm wonderful, thank you. I'm, of course, in London, which is quite some way from where you are. But we're having <laughs> a beautiful summer in lockdown here, so I have no complaints. Excellent. Yes, as long as everybody's staying safe, that's what's most important. And uh, I think we're making good use of our time today. First off, I'd just like to ask, Helen, who are you and what do you do for a living? I am the person who wrote the first book in English on Japanese animation. Um, and as for what I do for a living, I write, I speak, I make art and I make poetry. And I've done that since long before I did it for a living, like, like many um, people who uh, regard themselves as creative. And I think everyone is creative. It's just that some of us own the label and others for various reasons choose not to or don't. Mm. Um, I can't remember a time when I didn't make stories and make art. Um, mm -hmm. But when I found Japanese animation, I found a wonderful way in to the world of writing about things I loved. I'd done fiction for many, many years. I'd done stories. Um, I still do. But with anime, I found at that time a topic that needed a voice and didn't have one in English. And mm -hmm. so I responded to that by thinking, well, if nobody else will write the books I want to read about this marvelous thing that I've just found, perhaps I'd better do that myself. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the world is very appreciative that you've taken up that cause. Uh, speaking of anime and your love for it, can you tell me a little bit more about what introduced you to it? And more particularly, since we're a Leiji Matsumoto fan community, what introduced you to Leiji Matsumoto? Well, in the introduction to anime came in the way a lot of people's introductions do through through. A friend, in my case, a guy who went on to become my partner. Um, when I met Steve, he just graduated and was starting out as a freelance illustrator. And he and his friends had gone on a graduation trip just before we met. Um, all of them fine artists and illustrators. And they'd gone to Mallorca, which is a Spanish island. Now, as you probably know, Europe, um, Italy, France, Spain, have all had anime on TV and manga in translation, freely available since the mid to late 1970s. So when Steve went on his trip in 19, let's see, when was this, 1980, they found that they could actually buy and also see on TV all sorts of wonderful shows. At that time, they were mostly giant robot shows because Gona Guy was, was the talk of Europe mm. with Mazinger Z and Gold, Goldorak and all these other robot shows. And uh, they brought these th these things back and discovered that they weren't actually Spanish, but they were Japanese, but couldn't find out anything else about them. So when Steve and I met at that time, I was working for the British Library. And I thought, I have one of the great libraries of the world as a resource. I'll find out more. So I started to research and I couldn't find out more. There were a few tiny entries in in dictionaries of, of world animation done in America and in Europe that said very, very little, that basically summed up Japanese animation as Saturday morning kiddie robot pap with mm. a few good fine art animators like this guy, Osamu Tezuka, who entered things at festivals and, you know, more elevated forms of animation. But no, um, no awareness of the medium that, that I was looking for, no explanation of how it evolved, no explanation of who its main practitioners in the various technical fields were, no explanation of how its diversity of story came into being. Just a dismissal, a very, mm. very patronizing, I'm, I'm sorry to say white-centric dismissal of, mm. of this form. And so I thought, this is insane. I have to be able to find out more. And I knew that Steve had started in Spain. Now, I spoke no Spanish. 
which didn't matter because I didn't speak any Japanese either. And I was going to find out about Japanese animation. And uh, I knew that f from my memories, of because I went to a French convent school and we went to France quite a bit, from my memories of that, I knew I'd seen similar artwork in comic books in France. So by ferreting around European sources, I was able to find out quite a bit about the European end of anime and manga. And that's where I first became aware of the work of Leiji Matsumoto. Um, and of course, I also knew from other fandoms, because I'm a Trekkie from the word go, I was a Trekkie from the moment it appeared on British TV in 1969. And many Trek fans also had friends in anime fandom, mm -hmm. most of whom found it in or through contact with the American military. Because of course, ever since the occupation, the USA has had major military bases in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the service personnel there obviously get to see local TV, get to interact with local culture, and many of them became anime fans. So through European and American friends and contacts, I gradually began to be able to research anime, began to learn a little more. And as I said, came into contact with Matsumoto. Because of course, when Star Blazers, the version of Space Cruiser Yamato, came on American TV in, I think it was 79. It generated a huge wave of fan interest. Now, you have to remember, back then, fan interest wasn't as easily accessible as it is now. People mostly mm -hmm. didn't have the internet. Most people didn't have personal phones. You had to ask your mom or dad if you wanted to use the house phone because it costs money. Mm -hmm. uh, many people, in fact, didn't have phones in their own houses in Britain. I had a, a lot of friends in my early days in fandom who used to go to public coin boxes on the end of the street to call you. So it was a totally different world, and it took fandom a while to get off the ground everywhere. And America didn't have what France had, commercial channels who eagerly began to promote anime and manga in other ways by setting up magazines, by running articles in mainstream magazines by having Saturday morning anthology shows that chatted and had presenters who were very popular with kids and showed episodes, and also by selling a lot of the merchandise tied in directly. What America had was a huge population and some fans who were really, really determined. And through them, gradually, bit by bit, Matsumoto fandom got off the ground. But it was, I think it was 1984, before the first Lady Matsumoto fanzine appeared in America. So we were all kind of in the Stone Age in fandom terms back then. And mm. we were all struggling to, to put our interests and our love together. But gradually, bit by bit, we began to make inroads. We began to make an impression. And for me, the breakthrough um, didn't come as I wanted it. Because I'd said in 1981, I began to research and write this book that I wanted. And I was very clear on the book that I wanted. It was going to be a big book, an encyclopedia, with information about every single anime series, whether it had appeared over here in, in the West or not, information about every director and creative, information about the stories, how they were made, the art styles, the music, the tie-ins, the merchandise. It was going to have all of that. It was going to talk about influences because it was going to be a serious film book sort of film book that I was familiar with from, from reading about other films. It was going to talk about the great directors. It was going to talk about the major themes. It was going to talk about the different divisions of anime and manga into their, their various age bands and interest bands. Obviously, that was way too ambitious for the Western <laughs> market at that stage. That's too <laughs> ambitious for yourself, I think, at that point. <laughs> It was, but you never got anywhere by thinking small, did you? True that. Yeah. Starting small, maybe, but not thinking small. And I started mm -hmm. very small indeed. I started without even a computer at home. My early fan publications were done, and, and older fans will resonate with this, on a typewriter, cut up and pasted onto sheets with pasted-in artwork and, you know, very, mm. very old school indeed. Like an old zine. Yeah, I, they, they were, in fact, exactly like old zines. And, and the first fanzines produced in Britain for anime, even in the 90s, the early 90s, were done in that style. But mm -hmm. I've just begun here a bit because I'm still in the 80s and I'm going around to every publisher I can find pitching. And again, 
there's been a step change in the landscape of pitching to publishers. There weren't that many conventions back then. And most people just didn't walk up to publishers at conventions, even if they got to one, and say, hey, I've got a portfolio, can I pitch you? What you did was you wrote a letter, a physical letter, and you mailed it. Or if you managed to find a telephone number, you rang up the publisher and you said, I have this idea for a book. This is roughly it. Can I come in and talk to you? And I must have done that, oh, dozens of times and got mm. turned down almost every time. Once I thought, I've actually done well here. I've got a meeting. I got a meeting with a major London pop culture publisher. And I went along to their offices, best little interview suit, manuscript clutched in my hot little hand, and sat and waited and waited and waited. And half an hour after my interview was due to happen, the receptionist took a telephone call and they called me over to the desk and said, I'm really sorry, but Mr. X doesn't think that this will make a book. And he's mm. running very, very late this morning. So he's sorry, he has to cancel your meeting. Oh, I cannot tell you the bad words that ran through my head at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was obvious we were going to have to take another tack. So I decided, okay, there's a fandom growing up around this. There are people interested in it. If we can get a push, if we can make it a bit bigger and get to a critical mass, I can create a fandom. And perhaps if there's a fandom, that will be evidence that there's interest. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to grow British anime fandom. Um, and I had a wonderful stroke of luck because in 1988, some friends of mine were involved in organizing the British Science Fiction Convention, the annual convention, like the Worldcon, which is America's annual convention. Mm -hmm. um, and they'd had some problems with some of their staff having to leave, like any voluntary occupation. I'm sure you experience this sometimes on the podcast. People just call you and say, I'm really sorry, I've got to let you down. I can't do this. Something's come up. Well, they, they had lost one of their major pitchers and also the person who was going to run their art show. And I had quite a lot of convention experience here in the UK. So when they approached me and said, will you do the pitch and will you run the art show? I saw an opportunity and I said, OK, I will do the pitch. And if we win, I will run the art show, providing you give me a screening room and 32 hours screen time it doesn't mm. have to be a big screening room but it does have to be fully equipped and it does have to be capable of being secured because i want to run an anime program and some of it will be not suitable for under 18s mm -hmm. and they said yes they probably thought what do we have to lose if she doesn't win we don't have to deliver so we i, I went up there with two other colleagues i did a, a stormer of a pitch the easy way to win a science fiction convention audience is to mention bar in every third sentence, mm. certainly in Britain, because um, the, the, the chosen site had a very large number of bars. And by emphasizing this and <laughs> emphasizing the diversity and slippy and a sneaky, and we're going to introduce some new elements of science fiction and fantasy that you haven't seen before, like Japanese animation, we won the bid. And so I was able to get onto my by then very extensive network of wonderful friends in American fandom and French fandom and Italian fandom and say, I have a weekend's worth of screen time coming up for anime. Can you please send me as much good quality subtitled stuff on videotape as you can? And so for the next couple of years, my partner and I spent every spare minute watching videotape because we got... Um, I think it was over 350 tapes, um, three-hour tapes of anime. And it wasn't too burdensome because, as, as, as you may remember, if, if, you, if, if you did this or if you talked to anybody from that time, you could, by recording on long play, pack about six hours of video on one three-hour tape. Mm -hmm. The quality wasn't all that good. Yeah. So we had specifically said, please record at normal, normal speed because we, we, we have to show this to a room. And we were able to put together a program that was an absolute stormer, including a completely unofficial UK premiere for Akira, which would come oh, out wow. a year uh, later that year on, on professional legal tape. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge success. And people kept coming up to me all weekend and saying, you, you've, you've done this program. Where can we get this stuff? Where can we get more of this stuff? 
And so over the course of the weekend, we had a couple of little get togethers and we put together a list of people who were willing to subscribe to a newsletter. And by the time we got home, Steve and I knew that we were going to set up and run an anime information and, and contact newsletter. And we were going to try and use that to piggyback anime into enough prominence to sell books. And that worked better than we could possibly have imagined because within uh, our first year, one of our keenest subscribers had a day job in an old school hot metal type design firm, um, designing forms and brochures and all that, that business stuff that businesses can't do without. Because again, this was in the days before desktop publishing. This mm -hmm. was before every company in the world sacked their, their design and print firm and let the secretary do it. Um, and his boss looked at the newsletter when he was reading it one day at work and said, that's, that's funky. You know, what, what is that? That's really strange, but I like it. And he passed the newsletters to Peter and said, Japanese animation. And Peter, who'd been looking for something to diversify into, this Peter Gall, decided that he was going to fund us doing a professional magazine. And so within a year of EasterCon, we had a professional magazine to tout around, <laughs> which was unbelievably great and unbelievably silly because none of us had ever published a magazine before. None of us had a clue what it would demand in terms of time and money, which bless him, Peter put in magnificently he supported peter goal without peter goal british anime fandom would not have got off the ground as it did and will probably not be so strong today because peter gave it its platform and whatever i said we have to have he would look at me and say do you really have to have that or would it just be nice because it's going to cost x and i would say we really have to have that and if necessary i'll give up y to do it and he would do it we were doing all the things we loved in the Japanese magazines. We were doing see-through overlays with elegant silver printing on them. We were doing giveaways in the form of um, videotape inserts, tape inserts, calendars, cards, anything you could make from cardboard. We were just having so much fun, and it was a blast. And it was, the timing was perfect because we sold our first issue in 19, the winter of 1991 as Akira came out. Mm. And of, of course, timing perfect. Suddenly, every publisher who wouldn't take my meetings was ringing and saying, have you got anyone who can write about this stuff because we're putting stuff in our magazines? And of course, everyone on in our little group who'd been reviewing and contributing to the magazine and so on was suddenly a go-to person for this. And I got a call back from the publisher who kept me waiting and then sent me away for half an hour saying, I was right then, but you're right now. Come in and talk about doing your first book. And so it was. You're soon to publish Leiji Matsumoto essays on uh, manga and anime legend, correct? Indeed, yes. Yeah, and Although I, I have to say, this isn't just me launching this book. Appropriately enough, we have a, a whole crew yes. sailing the good ship Matsumoto, and uh, I'm co-editing with my good friend, Dr. Darren John Ashmore, who is a professor of anthropology and ethnography and who teaches international studies. He heads up the Department of International Studies at uh, Yamanashi Gakuin University in Kofu in Japan. And he was our way into Matsumoto himself because mm. he is, um, he's far too modest to describe himself as a good friend. He would describe himself as just a fan, but he has met Matsumoto on many occasions um, mm. as well as his wife, uh, Ms. Maki, and he knows uh, Matsumoto's staff. And it was entirely through his contacts that we were able to put this book together with the level of access that we had. So Darren is, um, he's a very unusual academic. He's, he's from Yorkshire in the north of England, which is a very distinct culture of its own. And the people are quite, quite different from the people in the south of England. Um, and he's been in Japan for about, to 25 years um, learning and teaching out there. Uh, he actually started actually in, in Japanese theatre. As an anthropologist, his fascination was with um, classical Japanese theatre, Kabuki Bunraku, 
no, mm. that sort of thing. Uh, but anime and manga gradually claimed him. And of course, also because he is a native English speaker and a fluent Japanese speaker, uh, any university setting up an international department is looking for plenty of that. So, so he's been teaching in Japan for quite some time. And we actually began thinking about this book around, um, well, Darren began thinking about it about five years ago. Uh, because he was very aware that there was no book on Master Leiji in English. And that although he was very much loved right through Europe, where um, mostly through Harlock, but through all, all, all his works, mm -hmm. and very, very much loved in America by generations of Star Blazers fans. I mean, there are now grandfathers taking their grandchildren um, to, to, to buy videos uh, of... of movies they watch when they were a little kid on TV. So many Star Blazers fans in the States, it's crazy. Mm. Um, but there was no um, writing on him. And in scholarly terms in the West, not that many people have explored any of the old classic manga and anime writers. There are a couple of, of great, great scholars working on, on, on that area, but not so many writing on Matsumoto, in fact, non-writing on Matsumoto before we started out. And Darren just thought, this is crazy. And when my Tezuka book came out, apparently Matsumoto saw it. And mm. my Tezuka book has opened so many, my, my Art of Asama Tezuka God of Manga was published in Japanese about six years ago. And it's opened so many doors in Japan. And so Darren decided that he was going to put together a team of scholars to do a book of essays on Matsumoto. And I came on board both to help with the editorial load and because I'm a good editor and I can turn text around across a very wide area. One of the problems with doing an, an academic edit is that generally speaking, you don't have more than two people working in any one time zone at any one time, because obviously scholarship is international and there are people from all over the world. I mean, we have writers in America, we have writers in Japan, we have writers over, all over Europe, we have writer, a writer in Saudi Arabia working on this book. So Darren asked me to come and contribute in that way, and I've also contributed a, a brief biographical sketch of Matsumoto. And the book that we wanted to do is both academic and accessible. We, we share, Darren and I share a common philosophy about academic writing that it should be readable by any intelligent person. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't exclude people by using jargon or using um, language that nobody can follow or being too arcane and making arcane Yes, arcane. you're taking a very populist approach to educating people on anime. Absolutely, and, and on Matsumoto, because there will be many very, very great scholars, we hope, who will read this book from various different viewpoints, but who know nothing at all about anime and manga. And so the brief to all the writers was, in your special area, using your own knowledge and your expertise of what you're working on, Write this so that your intelligent friend or relative who knows nothing about the topic can read it and follow what you say. Make it absolutely transparent, and then you will do a good scholarly job. Mm -hmm. And we've been utterly thrilled by the responses that we've had. It's, it's just been so wonderful. Matsumoto himself gave an interview to Darren, which we publish in the book and which has, has never been published anywhere before. Um, and Matsumoto is a really interesting interview subject. We could talk about that forever. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we've also got um, things that no other academic book has done. We have a practicing comic artist, graphic novel artist, and animation director talking about the genesis of what we call Matsumoto style and how that's been impacted by the Japanese practice of having assistants and having... Um, supporters and other hands working on finishing your workload mm -hmm. and that that is just it's a forensic sifting through layers of time to identify who's put what into how we see Matsumoto at what time and it comes from this is Tim Eldred who I believe you're going to talk to his yes. genesis as a Star Blazers fan and his own experiences working as a, a young American jobbing cartoonist on American Star Wars and Robotech and other anime books. 
it's it's just fascinating to have that engagement. We have a pair of very serious students of Japanese culture who are also cosplayers writing about how they approach the research and the construction for a Matsumoto costume. And that's remarkable because in that we see how you can engage with a text in so many ways. You can engage with it um, as purely as an academic writing exercise, or you can engage with it in just the same depth and with just the same philosophical inquiry to bring out of it a work of art like a costume or a set of costumes. And that, I think, is a really interesting way to interrogate the texts that, as far as I know, hasn't been, been approached with Matsumoto before, certainly not in the English language. And that's all really fascinating. I mean, I have actually been in touch with Darren uh, quite a while before we were in touch um, mm -hmm. because I had been working on Verse, and he uh, sort of communicated with me. He's actually done or helped to work on uh, a, another video documentary on Lieji Matsumoto. And he was telling me a bit, a bit about that. And uh, I have aspirations of doing so myself, perhaps if time and uh, space allow for such a thing. And yes, we are interviewing uh, Tim Eldred next week. He will probably be, uh, after this releases, the next interview to come up. So everybody stay tuned for that. Um, you know, I think it is interesting, though, how you say that Lieji Matsumoto is loved in the States. Now, I believe that his work with Star Blazers, which is uh, sort of a by committee work, even though he he led quite a bit of it, uh, is beloved here. But the name Matsumoto Moto is, in my opinion, and maybe it's not as well informed in you, as yours, but not as well recognized. If I talk to an anime fan who has come up in the last 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, if I mention the name Yeji Matsumoto to them, they may not resonate with that. And a lot of Star Blazers fans uh, that I've noticed who aren't in the more fanatical, uh, aren't going to conventions and things like that for Star Blazers specifically, may not even recognize it as anime. They may just recognize it as a cartoon from the, the 80s that they watched as a young kid growing up. Um, so I, I think there is a big veil of mystery on who Yeji Matsumoto is and his work's been kind of uh, chopped off at the knees in the States because of bad dubbing, uh, limited access, maybe even some Western misconceptions about Matsumoto's work. And we'll get to that in a bit. But firstly, you, you did mention that you did a book on Asuma Tezuka and, of course, brought Astro Boy to the United States and really started the legacy of anime here in many ways. I recently did a post about uh, Leisha Matsumoto and I made reference to the fact that I was under the conception that at some point Leiji Matsumoto was uh, the apprentice or assistant of Azuma Tezuka, and I had somebody uh, correct me and actually say that Tezuka was in some tight spots and needed some help, heard about Leiji Matsumoto, and actually reached out to him, and that's how their relationship began. It was not a formal apprenticeship or assistant situation in any way. And I, I think there are some misconceptions out there about what uh, Tezuka and Matsumoto's relationship was like. And I was wondering if you could shed any light on that. Yes, indeed. In, in, in fact, it's interesting you're talking there about um, an incident when Matsumoto was only 15 years old. And wow. Tezuka was um, really, really under pressure. And as a lot of artists in, in the manga industry did back then when they were very much under pressure, he decamped to a much quieter, more rural spot in order to get some work in without the constant pressure of Tokyo life all around mm -hmm. him. I mean, it's, it's hilarious if you, if, you, if you read the way he used to work. He would be in his studio and people would be lining up in the hall because he would be working on as many as seven or eight serials at any given time. Um, so editors be a constant queue of editors coming to see him and take away the latest pages. Uh, and, and he went off to this quiet rural town where um, Matsumoto and some of his school friends had done a manga magazine. They had a manga club, as many kids did then. And he said to them, okay, 
you can give me a hand if you would and help me get some inroads into some of this work. It wasn't just Matsumoto, it was several friends as well. But he was very struck by Matsumoto's work. He was extremely impressed by its potential. Mm. And um, although Tezuka was 10 years older than Matsumoto, and usually between a 15-year-old and a 25-year-old, you know, there's, there's quite a gulf. Yes. High school kid as opposed to comic superstar. But Tezuka, remember, had got his start when he was only 17. Um, he didn't turn 18 until the November after he published his first manga. Mm. And as a result of that, he felt very sympathetic to young kids starting out in the business. And he always had his eye open. Part of it was almost predatory. <laughs> Not in, in any in any in, in any improper sense, but he was thinking, yes. if I find someone who's really really good, maybe I can employ them, because he did sometimes employ help from from manga, and also, if I find anyone who's really really good, I can see what they're doing, I can look at their work. All manga artists, all artists, pinch from other artists, and Tezuka was one of the best of them. If he saw a really great idea or a good way of doing something that somebody else was using, he would find a way not to copy it, but to adapt it into his own work. The well, man- uh, you know, good artists copy, great artists steal is the the saying. Uh, it's possible, but you know, the manga scene was like one huge, huge incubator. You know how, like, mm-hmm. in, in music, I mean, in, in, in Liverpool in the 60s when, when I was growing up, bands would listen to each other and would listen to the latest records off the boat from America. Not necessarily to copy, although a lot of them would do cover versions, but to see things like how this or that artist did particular things, great sliding guitar runs, how a vocal mm. was handled, how you time things. Yeah, I think that's the 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 stealing there in, in that statement is you 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 take something and, and people would never know that you took it from something else. You've you've kind of made yeah. it your own in you a way. It. Yes, you you you've you've reworked it, but you you take it's it's like seed and fertilizer. You may have the seeds of great ideas, but they're fertilized by all the cultural influences that come into you from mm. all over. And Tessica was just the same. And so he and Matsumoto met, and they stayed in touch. Tessica was Tessica tended to write back to all his own correspondence. Oh, wow. Um, which was quite, quite some effort, because, of course, he wrote by hand. Japanese typewriter is a serious commitment, so uh, mm. it's usually quicker to write a, a short note by hand. And they kept corresponding. And when Tezuka saw Matsumoto's first full manga story, which he submitted for uh, an award to a magazine, he looked at it and he said, you have seen the spider and the tulip. Now, the spider and the tulip, Kumoto Tulipo, is a film, an animated film, that came out in Japan in 1945, in April 1945. For, as you can imagine, April 1945, Japan under heavy bombardment, fire bombings in Tokyo and in so many major cities, not a good time to be going to the cinema. But the cinemas that could keep open did keep open because there were a big boost to morale, particularly for children. And it happened that Tezuka, at this point, was uh, 15 himself, and he would take trains and walk miles to find a movie theatre, because he adored movies. This particular movie theatre he saw in a provincial cinema that ran it for one week on the last day of its run. And on that day, on the Sunday of the run, the five-year-old Matsumoto had been taken by his sister to the cinema to see this film. So the two of them sat in the same cinema at the, the last screening of this film in that venue and saw it together. And the spider and the tulip influenced them both so strongly that Matsumoto was still bringing it out in his mind all that time later. And the two of them bonded over that film and discovered that despite the 10 year gap in their ages, they had so much in common. They had so many shared interests. They both loved movies. They were both crazy about music. Something not many people know about Matsumoto is that he has done a huge number of manga biographies and stories on musicians of all types 
for a Japanese magazine called Record Pal. Mm-hmm. That's a uh, manga bio of David Bowie. Yes, there's a uh, lots of reference to vinyl. It's in one of the. Uh, it seemed that at the end of his volumes of manga, sometimes the the last issue would be something of a curveball and i can't remember which manga it is at the end of it there's a a lot of references to records and i can't remember which one it is right now you you might even remember what i'm talking about i do although i can't remember the title but he and tesca yeah. both were fanatic vinyl collectors I mean, mm. you probably know that Tezuka had um, music on in his studio all the time. And mm. he would invite his staff to bring in their records and, and, and share their collections, and he would share his own collection. But Matsumoto told, tells a story of when he was, you know, he was just a little kid in the war. And a huge number of Japanese men and what we would call boys, um, older teenagers, went to the front and didn't come back. Mm -hmm. And very often, their families would either sell because they were getting desperately poor or just throw away their possessions. And Matsumoto tells a story of picking up a set of Beethoven symphonies yes. in a muddy street and, and going home and carefully cleaning them and playing those Beethoven symphonies over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So vinyl really means something to him. Music means a way of transcending that really terrible time of being at war and then defeated and invaded and hungry and cold. And the Matsumoto family status changed completely after the war yeah. because Matsumoto's father, who before the war was a top test pilot for military aircraft and during the war was one of the most respected flight trainers in Japan, and also flew a combat aircraft, decided yes. after a particularly appalling mission that he could never send another young man to do that again. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the war, many Japanese fighter aces were getting offers from new aviation companies setting up in Japan for civil aviation. He could have flown any airline he wanted to, he wouldn't. Yes. And... That, that made such a deep impact on the family from being an affluent middle-class family. Suddenly they were living in terrible rented accommodation and he was selling vegetables for a living door-to-door, -door, running charcoal kilns overnight. And, and how um, many children were in that house? Do you know exactly? Matsumoto has a younger brother, Susumu, whom he talks about frequently. He is a uh, doctor, yes. now Professor Susumu Matsumoto, who uh, heads up, uh, headed up a major division of, Mats uh, of um, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. But he also had a sister. And I haven't been able to find out his sister's name because he very, very rarely mentions her. Mm. His sister died after the war. Yes. Um, tragically. And apparently of what he describes as a disease of poverty. Yes, he um, actually, I, I read an interview about it, and I believe she died in a car accident. An accident of some kind, but they yeah. couldn't afford to get her the treatment that might possibly have helped her. Yes, and he said that uh, he kind of lost the ability to touch on watching the death because he got to the hospital too late yes. to, uh, to to watch her death. Say and that her. was incredibly... Yeah, and all these things, I just want to recap because you, you, my mind keeps thinking of all these little, little other details like uh, how Beethoven's Third was actually the basis for the Yamato theme. Yes. And... Uh, you know, many, many other things along those lines. Um, and, I've, and I've already lost half of them for bringing well, up the one thing. It happens, but, but luckily yeah. this is a subject that we can revisit again and again and again, and yes. I'm sure you will with, with many interviewees. But Matsumoto is, is a man who feels, I think, very, very deeply and feels great family loyalty and, and still talks with the, the utmost respect and affection of his father and his mother. And yes, and proud of his brother. 
Yeah, absolutely. We talked about how his brother, I believe he's actually got a, a background in, in engineering of some kind, or at least he's very knowledgeable. And he, he references him for all of his spaceship designs, and he's very influential. And he even spoke with him about his his ring of time, his Tokinawa theory. And uh, speaking of Tokinawa, we've had a lot of Tokinawa members, the French Forum, uh, come on and talking about his father, uh, actually members of the Tokinawa community went in and did a lot of the digging and research to find out about Matsumoto's father because he would come to France and speak about how he was looking for more information. And we actually had a guest, Wacha, and his uh, wife, Claire, who did a lot of the research and made him actually a little book and did the digging in the uh, French military records. Yes, it, please watch that interview. <laughs> and you would home watch that interview as well. Um it is astonishing how much work the French fans have done on this. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've done quite a bit of research on French boards and French forums, and I have so much respect for their enthusiasm and their thoroughness. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they have a wonderful spirit of challenge there. It's, it's not, it seems to me that, that, although I'm sure this is partly because my French is less demotic than it might be, I speak very correct convent school French, very badly. Um, <laughs> but it seems to me that there, there is a lot of challenge in French online study and research, but there's also a lot of respect. There seems to be a level of dignity there. And, and when somebody gets something wrong, it's not you're an idiot, you've got this wrong. It's no, hold on, I checked this and I found this and that doesn't quite match your work. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lovely spirit and I, I really enjoy the time I spend on the French forums. And one of the things about scholarship is that we all learn every day of our lives and scholarship is, it's, it's scholar, it's a school. It's, it's mm -hmm. from the Latin for school. It's a process of learning. It's not a process of teaching exclusively. You don't just hand out your wisdom. You garner wisdom from all the people who've gone before you and all the people around you, and then you share it. And, and I love to see that online. It's just so great. Yeah, uh, I think uh, as well, you know, you talk about a scholarly approach. How does that line up with the word academic now? I'm not a entomologist or anything like that, but, you know, they, they are scholars and I have called them historians very specifically over and over again. Academia might imply something a bit more systematic and it, it, it perhaps doesn't line up as well with the concepts of freedom <laughs> and uh, uh, individual individualistic pursuit and uh maybe there's there's more of an openness to challenge and be challenged with that ethos of freedom that they have that may not fit into the quote-unquote academic mold you're making a very valid point particularly for the french because of course in the 11th century when when the schools of paris were rocking the known world at the time with their theological and philosophical debates, mm -hmm. there was a system of scholarship. Well, not a system of scholarship, there was a class of scholars called Goliards, who were wandering scholars. They weren't, um, they were all clerks, they were in minor religious orders because you had to be to get educated, but they weren't tied to a monastery or to a particular order. Mm -hmm. They were free scholars who wandered all over Europe, picking up knowledge wherever they could, trying to, to get to the, it was almost like a festival tour. It was trying to get to hear Peter Abelard speak. It was trying to get to hear all the great lecturers speak. And they would walk hundreds of miles from one school to another to, to just sit at the feet of the greatest teachers and then go and compare and contrast and analyze that with other great teachers. So the French are really good at that system of free scholarship. And, and I tend to think, I mean, I know a great many wonderful academics but i think of an academic as someone who is attached to and paid by an academic institution um if you are a scholar who's teaching at a university at cambridge or at oxford or mit or harvard you're an academic mm -hmm. if you're a scholar who is doing your work out in the world and doesn't make your your main money out of being a teacher and researcher then you're a scholar. But both mm. forms of scholarship are just as valid and both have advantages that the other lacks. And because I'm not, I never have been an academic, I'm not tied to a teaching schedule. I don't have to deliver a certain number of books a year. 
publish or perish is a terrible thing in most academic places. Mm. Um, I'm not committed to university terms. I can come and go and study as I please. On the other hand, if I were an academic, I would have free access through my university to any of the vastly expensive, and some of them are eye-wateringly expensive, academic books that are published with great work and research in them. If I could do one thing for the future, apart from world peace, of course, which we all want, and ending <laughs> hunger, yes. I would make all academic texts open access. And I think that would be the right approach. And I do apologize. I believe I, I did use the word academic to address perhaps you, but also maybe I used it to address your work where your work could be in an academic setting, right? I'm, so, I'm, flattered, I'm flattered by that because I know so many great academics and I would be very happy to think that my work could stand alongside theirs. Mm -hmm. And I know that it, it is in use in many, many academic libraries as well as film schools and, and other libraries all over the world. So I, I, I don't mind that at all. I take it as a great compliment. But I think in terms of the, the, the way one works and the structure of one's work is obviously affected by whether one is a formal paid academic or whether one is an independent scholar. And as a Goliard, you know, it, it, they're close to my heart, those guys. One of my favorite poets of all time, Francois Villon, called himself a Goliard at various stages in his life. The idea that you just pick up and go wherever you can learn is wonderful to me. But of course, it, it will play havoc with the teaching schedules of, of, of any any employed academics so they, they're deprived of that yes well i think at that point you don't have uh, students you might have disciples or something following <laughs> you around um just to we went on a fantastic tangent there but i do still want to talk a little bit more about asama tezuka and matsumoto's relationship just because i think there's a lot of misconceptions and i think we can clear some stuff up can you tell me a little bit more about how their relationship progressed i i understand at one point tezuka had to borrow a camera from matsumoto's studios i mean they were they were working maybe not together so specifically but maybe they did work together i mean can you tell me about about their relationship later on? Well, it's, it's a really interesting thing because, um, as you probably know, for a couple of years um, in Tokyo, Tezuka lived in the famous Tokiwa So building, um, the Tokiwa apartment house, with a lot where a lot of other manga artists congregated. And there were a lot of reasons for that. One was that it was a cheap apartment house that was well situated for getting to all the major publishers. So obviously, a young struggling artist coming to Tokyo, looking for somewhere where he could get a room that would, would fit within the money he'd brought from home and save him money on, on fares so he could walk to the publishers and, and, and wait till he started earning. That would be a real attraction. But also, of course, the fact that Tezuka was there meant that editors were coming out of the building. In, in, in and out of the building at all hours of the day and night. So there was a very good chance for young beginners to, you know, tug the sleeve of an editor and say, excuse me, I don't know if, you know, you might have an opportunity somewhere. Listen to and, my mixtape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was also a great opportunity for these young people to just learn from Tezuka, how mm -hmm. he handled himself, because he was very approachable. Um, he was always, you know, willing to, to stop and chat if he had a minute. He could talk while he worked. He was a great multitasker. And they would be able to pick up from him the hints and tips and habits of a successful artist, as it were. Mm. Um, but Matsumoto, when he came up to Tokyo from his home, deliberately didn't live in Tokyo. So. Mm. He got a separate apartment house because he's always been his own man. That's true. But he absolutely adored Tezuka, and he and his girlfriend, then his wife, Miyako Maki, used to go and hang around at Tezuka's apartment after he left Tokyo. So he would often have evening shindigs if he wasn't going out or working, or have friends over on the weekend, and they would just cook whatever he had in the house in one big pot. In fact, uh, Matsumoto tells some wonderful stories, and, and Maki actually tells a marvelous story about how. Um, they, they couldn't find a pot big enough to cook the noodles that they had in, so they used Tezuka's laundry base. <laughs> and just, just, you know, went ahead. They were a pretty bohemian lot. They were picky. Um, Matsumoto tells a wonderful story about Tezuka serving him noodles with chocolate sauce, <laughs> which he'd ordered in specially. And, of course, the, the connotations of chocolate sauce, big schoolboy gag about eating shit. Um, <laughs> Tezuka swore that he hadn't ordered them 
Someone else had ordered them. Um, the, 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 the shop obviously put it on for a joke. You know, they, they were great jokers. They were constantly laughing, playing music, having the best time. And you know, of course, about the time that they almost got arrested? No, I don't. Tezuka oh, and Matsumoto? And Shotaro Ishinomori. <laughs> Who had he 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 too had hit it off with both of them, and as a very very young man, he hadn't worked for Tezuka formally, but as a very very young man, he'd come down to make his way. And he's another person whose name is not so well known among the younger fans in America. Mm -hmm. um, I'll arc back to that later if you remind me. You were talking about how young American fans don't know Matsumoto's name, mm -hmm. and there are a great many great mangaka whose names they don't know. But he. Tezuka and Ishinomori just clicked. They got each other. And they thought of themselves and they described themselves as Japan's three biggest animation maniacs. <laughs> Japan's three big anime maniacs. So maybe Animaniacs owes them copyright. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> were they no, using the term otaku at that point? or They were not, no. Okay. It, it, language hadn't progressed far enough yes. for that then. But... Um, they were um, really, really keen on learning everything that they could. Before the war, Tezuka's father had owned a Pathé Baby projector, an 8.5 mil projector, and he used to buy films, Japanese films and foreign films, and run film nights for his family and for neighbours. And so Tezuka was used to seeing a huge range of films, and of course the war put a stop to that and narrowed the range of film he could see very severely. So after the war, especially when he began earning a bit more money and got through med school, he began to, to acquire as much film as he could. And of course, for film, you need projectors. And so the three of them were doing their utmost to buy up film and projectors whenever they could find them, whatever was on them. And at mm. one point, they were doing a deal with what sounds like some fairly shady guys for... <laughs> old film and old projectors from, from pre-war cinemas. Mm. Now, this interested the police because <laughs> you had to have a license to run a cinema and take money off people. Mm -hmm. And obviously there were tax implications as well. So you have a, a notoriously shady band of dealers and you have these three... It's hard for us to think of them now because we think of them as old men, but you have these three flamboyant wide boy artists <laughs> Um really just kids. Tezuka was, was in his mid-twenties. Um, Matsumoto and, and, and Ishinomori were in their teens. And from there, they never lost that habit of kiddishness. And so to the police, when this incident happened, there were three young guys um, who were making their way in the world and maybe they were going to run an illegal cinema. So they all got calls at home from the police inquiring about these bits of film memorabilia to them but film equipment to the police. And luckily, Tezuka was very well known at that time. And he was able to convince the police that the other two, although they were, they were only you know young men starting out, they were soon going to be very well known too. And he would see their names on the TV screen, just as he saw Tezuka's names on the TV screen. And honestly, honestly, officer, really and truly officer, these are not for commercial use. We're all animators, we're all artists. These are for our own use and our own interest and our own education. So could you please just make this go away? And luckily, the, the, the police saw the sense of that. And, and, you know, like anybody else, the police are starstruck when, when they meet big stars and Tezuka was a big star. <laughs> so it went away. But the three of them really, you know, they bigged up their reputations on this. No time about, uh, about how even the police knew that they were so into animation that, that they got looked at whenever they were buying things up. And mm -hmm. they went around calling themselves the three biggest animation maniacs in Japan. It became, you know, a source of pride, a bragging rights thing, that the yeah. three of them were so passionate about animation that they'd even attracted the attention of the police. <laughs> and it, it's, it's the, the, the thing that broke my heart in all the research I did for the book, was there's an interview that I, I got of Tim Eldred's fabulous website, Cosmo DNA. And Matsumoto says at the end of it, I'm so sad to think that the three great animation maniacs will never be together again. I just, that you know, seems unlike Matsumoto to say that. Just yeah. because of his, his general take on uh, the circle of time and, and you know, sort of 
uh, almost a reincarnation of souls. And, and you see that again and again and in all the Harlocks, just not even just part of the story where, you know, you see uh, uh, the ancestors of Totoro and Harlock flying together during World War Two, But, you know, you see it with Miku and we're on the fourth generation. I mean, you know, that seems very personally, pers- it's weighed on them personally, the death of all of his friends for sure. But I would say under Matsumoto's own beliefs that, they will meet again. Well, Tezuka was also a great believer in reincarnation, Mm -hmm. um, a great believer in karma and the working of karma through reincarnation. But I think that possibly Matsumoto hopes that, Mm -hmm. but doesn't feel he can impose that. Yes. Because he, the three of them existed in a universe that he didn't make and he didn't control. Mm -hmm. In the Lazyverse, he controls everything. Um, outside that, things go beyond. And just as I'm sure that he hopes he will meet his sister again, and I'm sure that he never stops looking for her in other faces because you don't when a loved one has died. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he has perhaps a little less certainty about that. Yes, it's it's hard to be certain, especially on the concept of death. Uh, But that's something that uh, the concept, he's helped so many, especially kids, come to terms with uh, death. And he's really humanized a lot of fantastic characters, you know, talking about something like the cockpit, humanizing these Axis soldiers. And I want to talk a little bit more about how how you were saying, you know, he didn't really catch on uh, in the U.S. He didn't as a name, you know, as a name brand where people would say, ah, that's a Matsumoto anime. And I think there are many reasons for that, many uh, possibly related to publishers, uh, but also possibly tied to his tendency to humanize Axis soldiers uh, such as you know, his, how his father was. And you you see that in the cockpit and you also see it in my youth in Arcadia where uh, Harlock's flying a plane uh, marked with the iron cross. And these are all my personal speculations, uh, but I wanted to hear your, your opinion on it. Why do you think Matsumoto just never became a name brand in the States? Well, it's it's interesting what you say. Um, We have a a wonderful chapter in the book by um, Jake Tarbox, who is a lecturer in Saudi Arabia, but who is also himself a a comic editor and practitioner. Um, He was one of the leading forces behind Raijin Comics, which you might remember from back in the 90s. And uh, he's lived many, many years in Japan. And his take on the cockpit is one that I think many Americans will find quite revelatory. Any scholar will find it revelatory because there's so much in there, but many Americans will find it revelatory because he emphasizes Matsumoto's view of the essential humanity of the ordinary soldier. And also how the ordinary soldier looked at in the context of war is very often very very much as much a victim as the people he's fighting. Absolutely. Ordinary soldiers are at the mercy of the economic and political forces of their governments. And they sign up and they volunteer, meaning nothing but the best out of sincere love and patriotism. I have so much respect for veterans like my father everywhere. But... Or, or unless they're drafted... Oh, and, 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 and even if they're drafted, they very often think, well... Often they do, yeah. This is it. I've got to do my best now. I've got to... Mm-hmm. This is the situation. I've got to live with it. But those soldiers very rarely feel antipathy towards the enemy. They, might, they, they, they have to be urged to consider the enemy as something they hate. It's just, it's just we're all here to do a job and we're doing it. And all, although you'll hear people talk about individual soldiers who have been individual enemies, who've been not humane and not honorable. Most old soldiers that I've talked to, and I I know quite a few from from my late father's friends, um, have a respect for the common soldier among their opponents because Mm -hmm. they understand that they are not doing this out of any antipathy to them personally. They're doing it out of duty to their country. 
Mm-hmm. And that, that, I think, is, is something that once you take it on board, it gets easier. The problem we have, and it's a very big problem for um, any Eurocentric culture, and America is basically a Eurocentric culture. America came out of Europe and still hasn't, mm-hmm. for all its efforts, still hasn't shed the worst of Europe. Any Eurocentric culture has traded on years of Judeo-Christian and Roman Empire education and considers anyone who isn't Christian and isn't white inferior or less human. And that's a cultural problem that we as a society at the moment are struggling with massively. But... It does create a problem when you come to present a work like Senjo, like the cockpit, which is so humane and so grueling and so wonderful. Because the first thing that many Americans will see is this is an apology for the Japanese war, Jap- yep. Japanese in the war. This is a range of excuses. And it isn't. What it is is a look at, I mean, Vietnam veterans look at the cockpit and recognize their own struggles there. Mm-hmm. Um, veterans of the Second World War look at the cockpit, and it's not that different from the war comics that they read. It's it's a, a universal human document, but the fact that it's about Japanese soldiers makes it really difficult for America to approach. And I think that in some ways that's down to America's current role in Japan as much as the Second World War. I mean, yes, Japan inflicted an appalling blow on America at Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. And it was to be expected that that would leave long, deep scars between the two nations. But right now, the country that dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan has nuclear warships docked there. Right now, the island of Okinawa, the people of the island of Okinawa, don't have most of their sovereignty because American forces there are treated under a different set of rules. And very often, in the opinion of the people of Okinawa, they get away with terrible crimes. I mean, I'm talking rapes. I'm talking murders. Mm -hmm. In ways that Japanese citizens wouldn't because they are protected by the American military. And All sorts of things. Nature in Okinawa is under constant threat from need to relocate bases and move things around. Um, The fighters, that the the VTOL jets that they use in Okinawa are apparently, I'm I'm no expert on planes, but from what I've read in the news media, are subject to frequent crashes, which are obviously very damaging. Um, Latest tragic case that I was reading about is a guy who's been trying for 10 years to get fair compensation as agreed between Japanese and American courts for the death of his wife after a young serviceman who was drunk and on a bender and needed more money for drugs killed her as she was opening her car door to get her handbag. And it's you know, really tragic. Th- things like that are resonant for the Japanese in very similar ways to how Americans feel about the conflict of the Second World War. So there's a lot of distrust there. But what's more important than saying one nation's wrong, another nation's wrong, is that when you have a situation where one nation has effectively colonized another, and even though the colonization has ended, restrictions on the native population continue, you get a buildup of two things. And forgive me if I digress a bit into my personal philosophy here, but you get a buildup of resentment, obviously, Mm -hmm. on the part of the the, the people who are being colonized or being exploited. But also you get a buildup of guilt. And America is carrying such a burden of guilt that I just want to hug them and say, let it go. Apologize. Well, it's interesting. I I mean... uh, Sorry, I'm... I'm, I'm, Yeah, go ahead. Huge guilt with Japan. And it is a huge guilt with Japan because dropping an atomic bomb on other human beings is something that no nation ever wants to do. But it also feeds into America's huge guilt over slavery and America's huge guilt over the massacre of Native Americans. And so America is carrying this psychic load of three absolutely appalling, almost genocidal events. And I, I honestly don't know 
how any nation can be strong enough to cope with that in such a relatively short space of time. Mm. In the space of 200 years, a very young country that hadn't had time really to come to terms with its own authority and power has virtually wiped out its Aboriginal inhabitants and still has them living in conditions of restriction and contempt for their own culture, which Mm -hmm. they absolutely do not deserve and which ought to be addressed. It's also treated the black people that it brought over as slave labour shamefully to the extent that there is still legislation that allows Americans to keep prisoners working for nothing. And as you know, the the prison population in America is disproportionately black. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's this terrible, terrible guilt of the atomic bomb in Japan. So I I honestly think that the therapy for that is going to take many, many years to work out. And, And what we were saying about American possible antipathy to Matsumoto and to all that kind of, 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 all that area of manga is a very real result of that terrible feeling of guilt and suffering because Mm -hmm. the generations of Americans since, since America was colonized, the generations of Americans since slavery was abolished, the generations of Americans since World War II didn't have any personal hand in those decisions. And many of them would have chosen to do it differently had they known how it would pan out. Yes. But there's still that awful feeling of responsibility. We know this in Britain, you know, m- many of us had, had I didn't personally because I'm Irish, but many people I know have forebears who were involved in the slave trade. Mm-hmm. And the guilt there is, is just quite appalling. When you say something like, well, America launched the, the atomic bombs or Japan launched kamikaze pilots. I mean, we, we generally, when we think about a country and we say a country did this, our minds are thinking of every single person in that country. And just as the, the soldier was not responsible greatly for what was being done overall, I mean, you have to look at, we, we need to address the, the Japanese government and the powers that be, or the American government and the powers that be, and, you know, the ruling class, whatever that is, uh, and separate that from the common man and remove the commoners sort of, uh, you know, guilt for it so that they can understand who was responsible, why they were responsible, and make it very objective so that we can process these things in a a less uh, sort of draining, emotionally draining and exhausting way so that we can take a step back. And and ultimately, I think that step back humanizes everybody much more severely and and allows us to move forward. but to speak on occupation for a bit, and we talked a bit about Harlock's ancestor portrayed as an Axis uh, soldier for hire, um, the occupation definitely having an incredible effect on Matsumoto. Like we said, uh, his family was destitute and his father had no inclination to go back to fight uh, for those forces and you know establishing his sense of freedom. Uh, but again, uh, Arcadia, my youth, uh, I saw an article online and it, this article wasn't a hateful article towards Matsumoto but it did list Arcadia My Youth as one of the most anti-American uh, anime films. That that film really resonates and, and speaks to occupation a great deal, especially uh, in the intro showing Harlock coming back to Earth and seeing what the occupation is like and being given food stamps and, and seeing the, uh, the squalor that people are living in I mean, that had to have had, uh, you know, do you, do you think publishers were looking at that in, in the States and thinking, we, we see where you're going with this, but this isn't something we want to glorify. You know, we got, we're moving towards a G.I. Joe era almost in, in this point, or, or living in a G.I. Joe era. I mean, how do you think publishers, or do you know how publishers were reacting to Matsumoto's works and and feeling a bit conflicted just because of how poignantly he depicted these concepts. I don't know whether that was a barrier 
But mm. one of the things that I can, I, I, I'm pretty sure most American publishers would endorse this is it's very difficult to sell to a large group of consumers something which says what you are is intrinsically pretty shit. Mm. Um, and there, there is, you, you, you're absolutely right, Arcadia, my youth, there is no doubt that the invading American empire is a very bad thing. It's not that far off the Nazis. And mm. that is a tough sell in America, partly, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're both going to get trolled to hell on this, so feel free to cut it <laughs> off. Partly because I'm ready for comments, is, yeah. Partly but... because it is not wholly untrue. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the way that many minorities are treated in America, not just Native Americans, black people, but all kinds of minorities, if you look at the, the response to the Hispanic immigrants who are a major source of labor and a major engine of the American economy, you could not honestly say that the descriptions in my youth in Arcadia are all that unfair, could you? Mm -hmm. And this isn't Americans. This isn't individual Americans. Individual Americans are just like individual Brits, just like individual French people, just like individual American Japanese. Japanese, yes. Some of them are nice. Some of them are <laughs> nasty. Most of them are nice sometimes and a bit nasty sometimes because we're human. Yep. That's how we are. But America, the great monolithic, great society of the 20th century, doesn't present well in the world. And mm. I think that's hard for Americans to swallow. I, mean, I get that because Britain has been in the process of losing its empire, in some cases shedding it, in some cases not so willingly, but losing its empire and losing its imperial protections for the past hundred years and having to face up to some of the things that we have done is not nice. Yeah. But it's, it's a maturing process. And I, th I honestly think that a release of my youth in Arcadia with a really great sensitive translator, there are some fabulous translators in America, a really wonderful, I mean, the work that Zach Davison has been doing on, on Harlock and Emeraldus is astonishing. Of course, you have the, the, the god of popular Japanese translators, Frederick Schott. There are so many good translators who could do a great job and an honest job on My Youth in Arcadia and make of it a wonderful pathway for talking about these things because one of the things that fantasy gives us, one of the things that writers like Matsumoto give us, they're unflinchingly honest about the real world, but by peopling it with invented characters, they allow us to take a step back from feeling responsible ourselves and talk about it in a more detached way. Just as, you know, if we talk about the monolithic political structure of America and the monolithic political structure of Britain and Japan. Instead of talking about the American people, the British people, the Japanese yes. people, we can detach from it. In the same way, we can detach from personal engagement and just say, this is a country behaving badly. How does it step back from the brink? So I think that if, if a publisher had the courage, a distributor had the courage to do a really great translation and a beautiful presentation, that could be a really positive step in helping Americans to engage with their history with, with Japan and with the rest of the world. And I think that even in the current translation that we have, the humanization of the Illumidas does occur oh, yeah. at the end of Arcadia. So Matsumoto is never in any of his work one to make individuals out to be purely evil. And I think that may also hold him back a bit in the in the States. You know, Yamato does it a bit. Uh, it's not as blatantly humanizing i think in a lot of yamato as it is in more so the harlock universe where you have the illumidos and their leader uh sort of coming around and saving harlock in the end in uh in in ssx you have zero who is a who is a human but he's he's 
tra uh, traitor to his own race, basically his own species. And uh, he comes around and given multiple chances and, and humanized there. So, uh, you know, do you think that maybe a blurring of the lines of good and evil and mainly portraying humans as humans or living species as living species more so uh, maybe confuses uh, a Western audience a bit more, at least in America? I think it does because, again, you, you have to go back to the whole business of er eradicating the Indians and taming the West. Mm -hmm. um, America has guys in black hats and guys in white hats. God help you if they ever swap hats. Mm. It's confusing. When you have a really big country with a lot of different interests coming into it from all over Europe, uh, fighting a lot of different interests, from, because, of course, First Nations weren't all living in total harmony. They were at war with each other, too, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But when, when, when you have a, a way of life that's agrarian and warrior-based and a way of life that's essentially industrial-based coming into conflict, you've got a lot of conflicts going on there all the time. And I think that anything that humanizes that conflict, any mythology that steps away from the white hat, the black hat, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, one reason why Hayao Miyazaki has been so successful in the West, because he allows you to have exciting, conflict-packed, engaging stories without having to say, he's all good, he's all bad. It introduces ambiguity. And I think America is a, a fairly young country with a fairly young mythology of its own, having rejected most of Native American mythology, obviously. Mm. Um, perhaps isn't comfortable with ambiguity, but if you look back at all those old European grandmas, all the Polish and, and Italian and Jewish grandparents who brought folk tales from the old country, all of those have crept into the American myth as well. And very often there's a vein going on there of, you know, the, the, there's the good girlfriend or the beautiful Indian maiden or the decent rancher saying there's a different way to tell this story and we could choose to do it differently. We could choose to make it warmer and softer and more human and less black and white. There is yeah. that there. So I hope that that will come through. I mean, you have, I want to talk about romance for a second here. You have the romance uh, taking pagan religion and integrating it with Christianity to uh, bring more people on board. So you have a, more of a poaching there. And then I think of the, the, the word romance, and, and I think romantic would often for most people really well describe Matsumoto. But when I also think romance, I do think more of the good and evil struggle and it being painted in a more black and white, th black and white way. But you don't see that black and white in Leiji Matsumoto's work, which is almost not romantic. But if you, if you hear him talk, you hear him uh, wax poetic about, you know, the things that he loves. It's very romantic. I oh, mean, yes. He's brought a modern sensibility to uh, a modern thought to uh, romance. And maybe that's the sci-fi influence in him. Maybe that's the scientific mind working in tandem, the left and right brain dancing in a way that uh, most human beings don't, don't think like. Uh, I mean, what do you think about that? I think that's a beautiful way to put it, the left and right brain dancing, because, of course, Matsumoto wanted to be an engineer himself. Mm-hmm. And he, he studied very hard, but then he realized that there wouldn't be the money for him to, to go to, mm. to university and get a doctorate and, and spend all those years working his way up. And well, he put his brother through he college, no? Because yeah. he realized only one of them could go through. And mm -hmm. he knew that he could make a living drawing because he was already paying for his own high school and contributing to his parents' income by drawing. So uh, he said, don't worry about me. I'll go to Tokyo. I'll make some money. I'll send money home when I can. Put mm -hmm. Susumu through to doctoral level and let him go and be the family engineer. But Matsumoto yeah. really wanted to do it. And, of course, he desperately wanted to be a pilot, because, but he couldn't because his eyes weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, now his, his one great ambition <clears throat> is to go into space. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's he's flown on some old timey planes. He flew with uh, Toki Noah not too long ago, so he he's been in the air at least. But yes, uh, perhaps 
perhaps he would not have been made for the acad the severely academic route or the severely militaristic route of uh, getting you know either in the air or working in an engineering place. Maybe his mind is better suited to an art form that if you forget one thing, you know you're you're gonna die. <laughs> he, there's more room for for mistakes and and humanity. I think I think he doesn't think that way. I think um, I mean I remember reading him talking about adopting his name, Leiji, Zero Man. Mm. A zero man is not a nothing. Zero is a positive concept to Matsumoto. Mm -hmm. People say you're zero, you'll never amount to anything. He says you're zero, and that means that you are a complete circle. Mm -hmm. Your end and your beginning are fused, you're eternal, and you're also pure potential. A zero man to him is pure potential, and I think he got that from his father. I mean, while all the neighbors, I'm sure, and everyone who knew them was saying, look how far they've come down from a successful upper middle class family before the war. And now he's an itinerant vegetable seller who mines charcoal kilns overnight and his wife's living in a rented place. All that while Matsumoto saw his father as a man who had kept his personal dignity and his pride and his duty to his family intact by behaving in line with his conscience. Mm -hmm. If he'd taken a, a, a job flying for the Japanese self-defense forces or flying for a commercial airline, they would all have been living comfortably. But in Matsumoto's view, his father would have been less of a man because he wasn't being honest to his conscience. Yeah, and, and perhaps he'd been defying his own destiny. You yeah. know, there's there's things like that where, you know, maybe if he got back in a plane... It would have been his last time at a plane. Maybe, you know, the universe has these ways of pushing people. I believe that. And I think that's severely ingrained in Matsumoto's thoughts. But I, th I think Matsumoto is so focused. And as, as, a, as a young man, he was so focused that had he had the opportunity to study engineering or the opportunity to get in on the ground floor of space flight, he would have just applied his brain to it and made a huge success of it. And that mm. would have been a great loss for the rest of us yes. because I mean not not, not wishing to, to disrespect anybody but we have a lot of great engineers all over mm -hmm. the world we have a lot of wonderful astronauts all over the world we only have one Lady Matsumoto <laughs> that's yes you know to me I think fate was doing exactly the right thing by putting him where he was uh, and when he was so you know we talked a lot about why uh Matsumoto didn't really take off in the West. We've also talked a bit about uh, all the, you know, sort of atrocity and difficulty that's going on at this point. And I recently watched your interview with uh, Momocon and uh, you with you and Tim Eldred, who again, Tim Eldred, stay tuned. It's coming. Um, you discussed a bit about um, the ebbing and waning, uh, ebbing and flowing of uh, what, is culturally relevant and it being based on the circumstances of a time that we're in and you pointed out that slice of life or you or tim had pointed out that slice of life had kind of come to uh, a fruition here and actually finally getting more of a foothold in the states that had always been a thing obviously uh, Otako oiden one of uh, the the work that put matsumoto on the map was a slice of life um but we we the far majority of Matsumoto's work is that sort of one man's battle against uh, the odds and overcoming things and the fight for freedom against oppressive forces. And, and perhaps now we're living in a time where that style can come back and, and be more of a force for people to rally people with art again. And this is all sort of priming for my question of, uh, what does the future of Leiji Matsumoto related works look like? Not just looking back at his past legacy, but moving forward as, uh, you know, even Astro Boy was still worked on posthumously as uh, Tezuka's creation. I mean, what are we looking at towards the future and how are people going to look at his past? Well, obviously, we've, we've got to think about the posthumous aspects because um, Sensei is, I think, 80, 81 or 82 years old now. 82, I believe. 82 years old now. So 
even if we are lucky enough to have him for as long as we had Shigeru Mizuki, Mizuki was in his mid 90s when he died. There is there is a finite point to Matsumoto's own contributions to his mythology. Um, and that happens a lot when mangaka get older. I mean, the great Ryo Koikeda, who did uh, Rose of Versailles, now doesn't draw stories anymore because she finds it just too taxing. Um, she's in her mid 70s, she still writes but she gets other artists to work with her. But she's also found another outlet in that she, she has, after many years, trained as a classical singer and she gives classical concerts. But the instrument does begin to break down. And particularly in terms of hand-eye coordination, that's one of the things that goes as one gets older, as I'm finding now, because one of my arts is embroidery. Mm. I love to embroider. Um, and a dear friend of mine who's now passed on said to me about 20 years ago, you know, you will get to a point, possibly in your late 70s if you're lucky, earlier if you're not, where your hand just won't do the things that it did anymore. This was my friend Avril talking about the fact that she could no longer embroider 40 stitches to the inch on silk gauze, mm. which is a task that many embroiderers can't do at 20. But... You know, there, there is that. You do realize that you get into the stage where you just can't do the things you did anymore. I noticed this summer in my garden that whereas last year I could lift 100 litre bags of compost with no trouble and just carry them across to where I wanted them. Now I'm struggling at 80. Next summer mm -hmm. I'll probably struggle at 60. It's just fact of life. Muscle loss and hand-eye coordination goes. So it's it's fantastic at all that he's still doing all these live drawings. I mean, it's one of the biggest events that he'll do. He'll still draw. And, and you know, his style was always loose. So maybe there's a, there's a benefit to that, that we're still able to watch the master at work. But yes, it's, it's, it, it may be deteriorating and it will only continue to deteriorate. It's human. But there are two things that I think will make the Matsumoto canon, the Leijiverse, endure. One is that it spoke on first appearance to a great many people at a significant point in world development over many years. A lot of young people had their formative experiences of falling in love with a myth with Matsumoto in the 70s and in the 80s, right across America, right across Europe, right across Asia. That is powerful. And that means that when some of those people embark on creative careers, that myth lives with them. And they think as Daft Punk did, wouldn't mm -hmm. it be great if we could get that guy who did those wonderful works that we loved so much when we were kids to work with us? Wouldn't it be great if we could do something with that myth? Yeah, it, 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 it's not just that, though, although I think that is very true and very powerful. It's that enough people, and quite unusually for many of us, women as well as men, because Matsumoto has given us some very powerful female archetypes in his work. So mm -hmm. many people look at that and want to pick up that kind of work and take it on. So it will have an influence going forward in all kinds of stories that don't just work directly within the Matsumoto universe, although hopefully that will happen, but yes. that also take its influence outside into other areas. But the other thing, of course, is that now we live in an era when Netflix, Prime, who knows what else, are coming mm -hmm. up and giving the opportunity to put all sorts of things on the airwaves. It's, it's, it's like when I, back, back in, in, in my early days in conventions, when I got my programming at EasterCon, I suddenly knew that I needed to get hold of a lot of material. Well, multiply that by 20 million, and you've got the position that Netflix and Prime are in now. They mm -hmm. need to acquire lots and lots and lots of material. And in manga and anime, they have barely scratched the surface. Yes. There are so many great mythologies out there that if if I were, if Netflix is listening, call me. I'm a very cheap consultant. <laughs> if I were at this moment buying packages, buy, buying licenses for a major streaming company, 
I can name you off the top of my head five anime or manga franchises that I would go and acquire in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And Captain Harlock is one of them. I've been lucky. Like I said, I, I got reimmersed in recent years and there are a few things on Prime. There's Arcadia My Youth. There's Galaxy Express 999 movies. There's uh, Cosmo Warrior Zero. Uh, you can find Galaxy Railways on Funimation. So uh, it's starting to happen. But manga, as you said, is completely untouched. And I think there's huge impetus to get things like Attica Oiden translated. And, and we're so not bound anymore by the need to make profit off of thousands of printed uh, manga. Now, all we need to do is design, uh, translate and, and design the manga and launch it. And that cost has plummeted over the last many decades. So we're not talking about huge investments here. And, and hey, Amazon, if you're listening, uh, Comixology, I'd love to consult too. <laughs> and maybe you could get both of us on here on this. But oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's huge opportunity for this to be done. And, and I may even uh, pursue a, a publishing route at some point myself. And, and that's what I think uh, Lazyverse is really trying to do is not just preserve, not just document, but move it forward. And it sounds like you with your new book uh lazy matsumoto uh <laughs> i'm trying to remember it because it's a good title, <laughs> it's a good title. Uh, essays <laughs> on essays on manga and anime legend yes you you're doing a great job to to preserve it but it's also helpfully going to move it forward by getting into the minds of young people hopefully in academia i believe you said you wanted kids to be writing theses on uh on the works so yeah yeah I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt there but i, I was quite Please. amused by that because the title is a great title but it's not the title that we actually gave it um it, it's the title that the marketing team at mcfarland believe will sell best okay <laughs> very often i mean this happens all over in, in any almost any author unless you are of the level of um jk rowling or lee child very few authors have the final say on their mm -hmm. book's title um, if, uh, if a company is taking on a book and is going to publish it and market it and put in all that money, obviously they want to maximize the earning potential. And so mm -hmm. they have whole teams of people who, who all across the industry who test and explore and turn around and say, this title is the best chance that you have of selling this. Mm -hmm. And, and so you know, it's the same with covers. Um, very rarely does an author choose their own book cover. You have yes. to be quite high up the, the food chain to get approval on your own book cover. Again, it's a marketing decision mm -hmm. and a design decision because some artwork, wonderful as it is, just doesn't have the right balance of space for the graphics that you have to have on a book cover for the title and the author and any mm -hmm. other words you need. So some, some art, wonderful as it might be, just has to be ruled out. What would you have called it? I think I would have called it Fantastic Voyage, the art of Lady mm. Matsumoto. But of course, that's mm. got too much connection with, with an existing franchise. Fantastic Voyage, yeah. Yeah, that, that can be tough too. Uh, I'd love to see it, you know, called the, the Liege verse. <laughs> but that would probably be a little confusing well, for people. In the Mike, universe, that would be great. There you go. There you go. Well, there's still but, time. No, <laughs> it's no, coming no, up. No complaints. McFarland yes. has treated us incredibly yes. well, yes. especially considering that it's very, very rarely that a publisher will publish a book on something that nobody has touched before. Mm -hmm. Because there is no marketing data on that book. Yeah, I mean, first to market is often a very difficult position. And generally, if you're a publisher, you'd like to be a fast follower, as they call it, and uh, and come come second to market to be able to refine on what's happened before and take an audit. But I, I, I appreciate you and I, I congratulate you on being a pioneer on the subject, along with uh, Darren Ashmore and, uh, and I believe I said that right, and uh, Tim Eldred. And yes, I hope we do see some more works coming out. Uh, unfortunately, there was uh, the Gynax snafu going on here that crushed Zero Century uh, for the time time being, I'm very hopeful that another publisher will take up what's what's there and move forward. However, likely or unlikely that is, remains to be seen. I'm not sure if you have a say, uh, uh, an opinion on that. Um, I don't know. 
Anything yeah. involving Gynax is always complex because their yes. financial background is, 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 is quite complex in itself. And there are all kinds of corporate um, machinations going on that most of us will never be aware of mm-hmm. that have a great deal to do with how things are organized in corporate terms, in financial terms, um, what the current standing of various aspects is. So I, I think it might be unrealistic to hope for too much movement on that. But Gynax, yeah. you know, since, since they were fanboys, you can never say never. They have a yeah. habit of reinventing themselves and, and coming out of nowhere. Yes, they've been they've been bought again, and and the original Gynax, I believe, is is long gone from that connection. But uh, there are always going to be new generations that come on and carry on the torch and fight. Um, as far as uh, Leiju Matsumoto's production and his investments and and his studio work, uh, I mean. Is there going to be somebody there to carry on the torch of his records, his production techniques, his his work industrially? I mean, is there anything going on on that front? That's something that I really can't talk about. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's partly a family thing. Um, mm-hmm. Both um, Matsumoto Sensei and Miyako Maki Sensei have got um, big, big interests. Um, Maki, especially as the original designer of the Lika Chan doll. Yes, the uh, Japanese equivalent of Barbie for anybody who wouldn't be aware. And one of the, one of the foremost women manga artists of her day. Yes. Um, she's got large interests of her own, as well as her joint interest in Matsumoto, because they collaborated quite extensively earlier in his career. Um, and their families obviously have an interest, and there are also various publishers and businesses with an interest. So I think with that... We will just have to wait until either Matsumoto himself or his office or the family release some more information. It's it's mm-hmm. very difficult to say at this stage. It always is, isn't it? I mean, in in, fam- in any family, you're thinking, oh, my God, has granddad made a will? Yes. Has Aunt Maud thought what's going to happen to all the horses? And it's, it's, it's a really difficult subject to approach. So I don't know is the answer. But I think um, we just have to wait and see what what eventually emerges, and hopefully, planning will go on at this from from this stage if it hasn't already gone on, so that there can be no confusion and no legal dissension about the status of titles. Because from from my own experience, uh, one of, one of my in laws died in test state, mm. and that was utterly horrible because the family had totally different opinions about what should happen. Um, even the simple issue of what should happen with the body and the person mm-hmm. effects caused fights for years. Yeah. So one wants to avoid that when one can, but I, I really don't know. It, it is difficult, and uh, Matsumoto unfortunately has something of a, a hit-or-miss legacy when it comes to working with publishing companies, uh, not just in Japan, but in the United States. You know, we've got Harmony Gold kind of disrespecting his work with their dubs, and uh, we've got production companies saying they're going to make a live-action Harlock this or uh, a 3D animated uh, Galaxy Express that, and and things aren't coming to fr- and and guy now is another example so uh, I am hopeful that uh, some somebody with uh, the same sort of ethical spirit of Matsumoto will you know go in and, and help with that particular situation I, I I think we're all hopeful for the best uh, that that some someone nasty or something nasty doesn't come around and uh, tarnish tarnish that or make it harder to get a hold of which is the whole thing that I think both of us are are working against to make sure that these things are accessible. Um, well, of course, he himself has said that as long as he, he, he wants to live forever, so he's just yes. not going to finish everything, and then he'll mm. have to live to, to carry it on. Whether, whether that works, I don't know. I, mean, I love the idea that an author could say, if I don't actually finish this mythos, I, I will just be kept alive by fate until the right time. But I, I would very much like to see him reach his century. Most most mangaka, um, certainly most mangaka of that generation, of the wartime generation, haven't been as lucky as Mizuki was. Um, he had a very long life, and apparently he was working almost to his last day. Mm-hmm. 
um, and in good health almost to his last day, in relatively good health for a person in their 90s. Um, there are a number of mangaka who are now in their 80s and still working. And so we can hope that possibly Matsumoto may, may, may see us through another decade, another couple of decades. And that would be utterly marvelous if he could. Absolutely. Because one of the things about, about a great writer and a great creator is that even if their, their hand-to-eye coordination and their ability to do things physically goes, their ability to construct a story often remains. And these days with, with, with dictation programs and with all the help that one can get, Matsumoto could, could go on creating for a very, very long time in story terms, which, which to me would be a wonderful blessing. Absolutely. And, and I would hope that, you know, somebody carries the torch and it would be nice for, for that to happen as well. But uh, time, time will tell. But as, uh, as Sensei says, uh, time, time doesn't betray dreams. Beyond just the legacy moving forward, uh, what has the Matsumoto Legiverse uh, legacy done to anime and manga itself? It's difficult to say. Um, except that it has reintroduced the possibility of space opera. In, 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 and, and that in itself is a huge impact, because look at what Star Wars did for science fiction film. I mean, and you look at Star Wars in general and you're like, okay, Darth Vader's from some common writer ma manga, uh, you know, is... What came first, Harlock or Star Wars, Chicken or the Egg? I mean, that's, that's it. We are. We're, we're doing that because we're in a position to take a, a broader view. Mm -hmm. But for most people um, at the time, when Star Wars burst upon the science fiction scene, it was like nothing you'd seen for years. It was like nothing since Flash Gordon. And of course, most people's parents didn't even remember Flash Gordon. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it had a huge impact on visual science fiction, but it also made it fashionable to write space opera again. And in just the same way with, with, with Yamato, Matsumoto made space opera, big romantic stories about epic adventures and quests for death or glory. He made them work again. And mm. that was even harder in Japan because, of course, the whole, one of the attempts of the Allied occupation was to wipe out the whole of any previous militaristic or samurai-type fiction. Mm -hmm. That just couldn't be allowed anymore. And Matsumoto, in those, those fairly grim years of the 70s when Japan hadn't yet begun to boom, was saying, look, this is there and it's real and we can have it back. Do it. He was talking about honor and glory and beauty mm -hmm. and following your own dream, even if everybody else in the world is doing you down. And that had a huge impact. I mean, there were, there were so many, so many writers who looked at that and immediately turned around and started doing big romantic stories. And I think things move in cycles in, in, in media, in science fiction, in animation, as with everything. And what he did was he created such a credible extended cycle of heroic space opera that it's made it quite difficult to think of him in any other terms if you're outside Japan. And of course, that's one reason why so many people, aside from the political dimension, don't realize his ability as a contemporary writer because they haven't seen the whole of the cockpit because they haven't seen Otokoi do it, because they haven't seen his his contemporary, his daily life works. They know him only in the, in the context of this huge, epic sweep of drama. Mm -hmm. And it's not that he's two writers, because I think with Cockpit and with his other works, they are fully integrated into his work, but they're not known. So for the future, it might be fun. I mean, I, I have fantasies about a, a full, beautifully bound, beautifully translated editions in series of the whole of author's works. And Matsumoto mm -hmm. is a an author. I'd love to see treated like that. So that they can all be considered together in the same way. 
that will be that will be that will be exciting and engaging. But I think yeah, the, the, going back to space opera, the whole idea of this genre that so fires the imagination that goes all the way back to the legends of King Arthur and the legends of Robin Hood and and, and the great Babylonian epics before them is really deeply embedded in human consciousness because as a species we've spent so much time fighting each other and being fairly vicious to each other and so when you get an author who could say here is a modern version of the stories that we've been telling each other for 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 years, which takes all that new technology into account, but stays faithful to the core of the story, which is how do you behave under pressure? How do you be true to yourself? How do you respond to situations where your community needs you? That's always going to be remarkable. That's always going to play well. That's always going to have a future. And, and that's a wonderful impact to kind of recontextualize those old stories in, in a new sense. And that, that is very important. What was the most interesting tidbit that you learned about Matsumoto? Um, even if it's not the most interesting, just tell the audience something that you think they may not know. Something that really sticks in my mind quite strongly is... The story he told about his tr his first train journey to Tokyo, which mm. came back for Galaxy Express later. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about the great kindness he met from other travelers, because, you know, nervous teenager on his way to the big city for the first time. And he was talking about how somebody gave him uh, a rice ball to eat and somebody bought him a bento box because he didn't have lunch money. And somebody else, on, real, on hearing that he was off to get a job writing manga, decided to toast him in sake. Mm. And he'd never drunk in his life. <laughs> you know, he was a kid. Yeah. He'd never drunk in his life. And he just didn't know what to do. But he thought, well, they're really kind people, and I can't offend them. So he took his glass of sake, and he didn't sip from it, but kind of pretended to sip from it, until there came a point in the journey where everybody's attention was distracted, and he could chuck the sake out of the window. <laughs> and that, that was just so sweet, and uh, that, that was such a touching and a lovely moment. Very and wholesome. The, oh, yeah. The, the other thing I love is how he talks about his wife in terms of the greatest affection and respect. But they were both very hands-on and very strong collaborators right through. Yes. And he found a, a photograph at one stage, which unfortunately we weren't able to get for reproduction, of a project that they did and got very fired up. So do you remember, this is where we built that multi-plane camera in the house. Mm. And in, in the studio, the two of them together built a multi-plane camera, not for animation purposes, but to shoot a particular cover that yes. he was working on for a magazine. And just the thought of, you know, the two of them just getting together and getting out the toolbox and putting together this piece of kit and using it and playing with it. It's so playful and so lovely and so collaborative. It's a really wonderful image of a very solid marriage. Do you know anything about Miyako Maki's retirement? I mean, she she seemed to resolve it seems happily to the the more traditional japanese housewife sort of lifestyle uh, or at least that's how it's been reported i mean do you know much about her her taking a step back like matsumoto she said a number of different things in different interviews um hmm. i mean I, I read a number of interviews with her in which she said she decided that she wanted to be a traditional japanese housewife and of course you've got to remember that she is three years older than him and she was already a famous and very well-established mangaka yes. when they met. Plus, she had all the Lika-chan fame and fun and money. And I know that she's still quite hands-on with Lika-chan from conversations that Darren Ashmore and I have had, because he's had conversations with her about this. I think that, on the one hand, she probably felt that it would be less challenging for his career for her to say that she was stepping back, whether she did or not. Mm. And on the other hand, she may have quite enjoyed a slower pace 
to do her own art and create her own things. Yes. Because what one of the problems with being a working mangaka when you're on your own is that everything is on you. You know, mm-hmm. all your bills, all your living expenses, all the work, all your housekeeping, all your keeping up with your professional commitments, all the salary for any assistance or any services you use, it's all on you. One of the great things about entering a partnership or a relationship that involves living together is that immediately all your domestic responsibilities are at least halved. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, of course, you can take a step back in your professional responsibilities, and that can be very freeing for a creative person. Yes. So I don't know if this is the reason. This is just me speculating. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if Baki Sensei thought this is a really good way of my continuing to work at a lower level, attracting less attention and less pressure, but having time to do projects in the way that I want to do them. And for the two of us to collaborate together and, and just enjoy being together. Yes, that that sounds like uh, uh, quite a quite a strong possibility, and it's much more satisfying to hear than oh she she became a housewife because I, I think at least in American culture there's a lot of. Uh, maybe a feeling of indignation for that uh, sort of approach to life uh, where, you know, oh, well, Matsumoto kind of overtook her career and she took a step back and it, it you know, that creates kind of a negative narrative. And I, and I like hearing what you had to say about it a lot more. It sounds a lot more uh, contextual and, and important. So, well, yeah. It, it, is, it is, though, it's quite a contemporary view because you have to remember not that long ago in real terms, when mm-hmm. um, the TV show Bewitched was made, which was hugely influential in Japan, of course, mm. uh, the mere idea of Samantha not just wanting to work outside the home, which she didn't, but wanting to continue with her gift, her witchcraft, was one that got her husband quite upset. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of a wife having any interest beyond the husband and family is still very common in America and in Europe. It's, it's, it's not unknown for people to still be old-fashioned about that. And mm-hmm. if you look at, again at Hayao Miyazaki, uh, Miyazaki's wife, Akimi Ota, was an animator at Toy when they met. Mm. And I remember reading an interview with Toshio Suzuki when he said she was actually much, much more gifted than Miyazaki. <laughs> she was a far more gifted animator than he ever was. Mm. Um, but when they had their second son, she decided to step back and retire. I think possibly because at that point she could see that her husband's career was getting to the stage where it would occupy him day and night at busy times. And if there was going to be somebody at home with the boys, it was going to have to be her. And sometimes, mm-hmm. sadly, even, even nowadays, a lot of women, I think, realise that the responsibility for the family is always going to fall primarily on them Mm -hmm. and that they have the choice of either ending a relationship, which has its own problems, or trying to keep up their own professional identity at the cost of possibly their health and their happiness and their sanity or stepping back and looking after the family. Because once you have a family, somebody has to be there for the kids. There's, There's no argument around that. Yeah, Miyazaki is uh, generally described as an as an absentee father, uh, and there's difficulties within his own family walking out on uh, his son Goro's first film. Uh, he's documented it's it's on tape him doing that and walking out for a smoke, saying, "I feel like I've been in there for three hours, and the movie's only halfway over." I mean, he's he's quite brutal. Um, I, I don't believe Matsumoto has children, so I think that that removes a lot of that difficulty and perhaps. Perhaps they both came to the understanding that their work was their children and that it would be less toxic to make more of that and focus on that than uh, to pr- produce a life which may not get the uh, parental upbringing. But uh, in turn, they did their fair share of raising quite a fair bit of the Japanese population, I'm sure. Oh, um, yes. I think in fairness to Miyazaki, it wasn't just Goro. Miyazaki is quite vicious about yes. most of the young directors. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, most of his colleagues, and and that's for a different fan page that I won't be operating. Uh, no, no offense, I like his work. 
So this is a fan group. I've been speaking with a lot of fans and perhaps you have an insight on this. I've noticed that specifically with Toki Noir, they contributed a great deal to a bunch of uh, DVD releases by Kaze. They did fan commentary. They did a lot of write-ups. I mean, they, they work to, you know, expose a lot of Matsumoto's father's own history, but they have a hand in the work, it seems, uh, that seems uncommon. You know, if you look at Dragon Ball, I always bring it up, but they, constantly are releasing these DVDs and fans are unsatisfied with the products that are being made from the thing that they love so much. But I don't see that so much when it comes to Matsumoto anime, at least in recent years, since 2003. That seems to be the turning point in uh, in France, at least. And I was just wondering, do you find that Matsumoto fans have sort of a deeper impact on the series than other anime? You're probably the most qualified person I've I've asked this question to? Oh, I think for a really good answer to that, you would have to ask somebody in the French distribution industry because it is very much a, a French issue, I think, and possibly to an extent mm. an Italian issue. Um, Matsumoto fans in France have been in a different position than Matsumoto fans in America from the word go because anime and manga have been in a different position in France than in America. Uh, they've been popular and on TV, and that's meant that children have written letters about them and grown up through the fandom and been able to establish relationships with young distribution companies and young publishing houses mm -hmm. and have been among the, the pool of labor that those companies can draw on. Yeah, I mean, well, Cedric Letardi uh, from Kaze actually approached Toki Nawa at a convention, and I spoke with him recently, and he he was like, well, he's kind of an exception in his own right because he's a very it was a very small organization that came from a magazine, and they they uh, they reached out very directly, and perhaps okay, so maybe I'm just seeing this now as you're saying uh, more so in France and Italy, those fans are having a, a big bigger impact because they grew up to, to publish, publish it themselves. Yes. Is that okay? It's very, it's very much the Japanese model. Uh, as you know, mm. all over Japan before, well, actually, I think probably still after COVID-19 because they haven't locked down the way many people have. There are small um, comic marts and small comic circles, and people come up through those circles publishing their own private doujinshi and making contacts that way. And, and companies on all levels in the Japanese media industry, actively recruit from the larger comic marts and from Comic Ed itself. Mm. And so what they get are people who know the fans, know the fandom, know the work, know how things happen. So instead of taking somebody in with no idea about your industry, however well qualified they are, you have someone who's been part of that industry from the time they were 12 years old and drawing their own comic and sending it off to the TV station for approval. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much more, in France and Italy, it's much more the Japanese model than it is elsewhere, that mm. not, not through the same mechanisms, because it's been more through commercial fandom, but the fans are very much engaged. Okay, so so basically, I'm I'm seeing in France something happening that's been happening in Japan all along, which is fans who are qualified are brought up and given more of a chance, and that does seem to be the culture more so in Japan, where if people are enthusiastic and at all qualified in Japan, they're much more willing to give you a chance than, say, in America, where 90% of jobs are gotten through nepotism. I mean, you've got to know somebody or have an in somewhere to get somewhere, where it seems like in Japan, and I've heard this from American voice actors who live in Japan, that if you're qualified and passionate, they'll give you a shot. Hmm. And, and if it doesn't work out, there are 50,000, 60,000 yes. other qualified, passionate people that they can get. So mm -hmm. you're not their only shot. So yes. they know that when they do give you a shot, you're not going to be precious or pissy or waste anybody's time. You're going to want to keep that place because you know there are so many other people clawing up after you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think a, a lot of it too comes down to um, scale. In Japan, although it's a small country, it's a huge population. 
And there are all these comic markets and fan events and so on that fans can filter their work through. In America, in the same way in the 60s and 70s, lots and lots of regional stations, local stations. It wasn't that difficult in America or in Canada for two kids like my ex next door neighbor and her brother to get a TV, a radio show mm. playing guitar and singing traditional Scottish songs and then later a TV slot. So there's a chance of clawing your way up. Whereas here in Britain, where we didn't have that tradition of, of um, anime and manga and where we certainly didn't have that many TV stations, there's very, very little chance to establish yourself like that unless you are connected. Yeah. People now say, oh, you've got to have a connection to get in. You've got to have a connection to get there. But I still think if you work really hard, if you take the trouble to approach people in a respectful, considerate fashion and you keep putting yourself out there, you will get your chance if you're any good at all. Most people are not committed and are not passionate about what they do in their life. They get committed or passionate around you know, their hobby or their team or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you start out being passionate about anime, manga, comic books, whatever it is, and you take every single opportunity to learn what works in those industries, to learn who's successful in those industries, to model yourself on them, to present yourself consistently and to deliver, you're going to get a chance. Well, that's a very uh, positive way to look at it. And for anybody uh, feeling like they're they're disconnected and unable to uh, approach their dreams, uh, you know, you're a great example yourself, Helen. So uh, I thank you for again for all the amazing work that you've done. I don't know how briefly you could do this. Uh, how, how briefly do you think you could summarize your process for writing a book? Oh well, I, I'm very fortunate in that. I do sometimes get commissioned to write books that other people want. Mm -hmm. But most of the books I write, I've written because I wanted to do them. I've had an idea, I've gone and pitched it, and it's worked. But the, the process is the same whether somebody comes to you and says, Helen, we want a book about Hideaki Anno, or whether I say, I really, really, really want to write about Chieko Hosokawa and her great manga, Seal of the King, um, and I'm going to do this as energetically as I can, and uh, okay, no more show, sorry. And I'm, I, start, I start with what's the book going to be. I always assume an intelligent audience, but sometimes you think, is this going to be a young audience, an old audience? I look at everything else that has been written in the field, and I say to myself, is there something new? that I can bring to this topic around all these other great writers? Is there something I can do that will make this book worth adding to your bookshelf if you already own every other book on Osama Jessica, if you already own every other book on whoever? And once I've decided what that is, generally, if I've already been asked to do it the publisher will know my work and will have given me an idea of what sort of book that they want if not I will write a brief outline of the book just a short description no more than a couple of paragraphs of what I want the book to to be what I want it to do and to achieve and then a list of chapters which often gets chopped around and changed later but just to give the book a shape on the page um, maybe some notes about other people that I might consult, other resources that I might consult. Um, definitely, if I want to sell it, some notes about people that I think will be willing to help promote it or organizations that are going to help me work on it. And then that goes off to a publisher whom I've selected because I think they will be interested in the, the field that that book is in and they do books along these lines. And that goes off. I mean, the, the main point of that process is to identify what the book is going to be, give an outline of its shape, and then I can point it at the right markets. And an awful lot of people who are doing a book do the book and just send it off at random to any publishers that they can think of mm -hmm. who do science fiction, fantasy, whatever. If you actually look at the books those publishers do, look at what kind of books they are, how long they tend to be, 
what market they tend to be aimed at, what level they're at, you can actually target your pitch to the publisher you send it to. And that must give it a bigger chance of success than just getting something at random. So it, it, it's, it's twofold, really. The process is thinking about the book, but also thinking about who might publish it if you're having to pitch it. And of course, all the time thinking about who might read it. What will you give them that they don't already have? What can you offer them in the way of an Easter egg, a surprise, a, a joyous experience? And those three things are always in my mind as I work. After that, it's just straightforward professionalism as with anything else. You have your deadlines, you agree them with your publisher, you hit them. Mm -hmm. You hit every single one regardless. And if for any reason whatsoever, however cataclysmic, you find you cannot hit one, you immediately contact your publisher and apologize and replan. And the reason for that is that once you undertake to write a book for somebody, and you give them a delivery date, a number of big financial decisions line up behind that delivery date. Yes. Things like how much paper does the publisher buy? Paper, paper is a scarce commodity in this world. It's bought ahead of time. Now, because it's bought ahead of time in however big a quantity they're planning to make your first print run, it has to be warehoused. Shipping has to be booked because very few books are made anymore in a single country, let alone a single city. They may be printed in China, bound in Holland, then shipped to Belgium and mailed from there. So all those links in the chain have to be booked. People will be relying on those as part of their cash flow. Businesses will rely on those. Mm -hmm. If you're a week late on your delivery date, that's a week's more warehousing on the paper. That's a change in shipping schedules all the way up the line. That's a change in delivery schedules to bookstores who will not absolutely will not unless your publisher pays them keep the shelf space assigned to you for another week yeah so professionalism is so important and the one thing that i stress and stress and stress i do workshops on this at conventions is never miss a date and if you absolutely have to miss a date everybody has to know about it way in advance yeah a major tragedy obviously people are sympathetic your parent or your child has just died. That's going to affect anyone. And I'm really sorry, but your cat has just died. It's not going to cut it unless you're J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Um, you know, there's... The, sorry, cat lovers, it, but that is the truth. Yeah. No, that's a very important point for anybody who's looking to make a book. Uh, in less than a minute, can you talk a little bit about your research process? Oh, that is the most fun. You know those big, big cages of multicolored balls that they have in, in kids' mini yeah. fitting areas? That's, that's my research process. <laughs> I dive in. And yeah. literally, when, 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 I, when I'm... When, now, generally, I've, I've just um, finished a book and I'm starting the research for another one. And you just swim around in all this wonderful stuff, reading as much as you can, watch as much as you can, pick up as much as you can, spending quite a long time walking and thinking and sitting mm. in the garden and thinking. And then you begin to read everything you can on the topic that you've chosen, everything mm. at every level, everything you can get your hand on. And gradually I, I keep little notebooks and notes on the computer and something starts to take shape out of them and you begin to see ways through it. But the important thing for me with the research process is it's never finished. You keep checking back right through the book because especially if you're researching a popular topic or a topic that's just beginning to trend, there will be new things coming out that you need to take into account. And mm -hmm. the most agonizing thing, the worst thing that can ever happen to any writer is that you finish the book and you send the manuscript off to your publisher and it's in process and you're expecting the first galley proof to check through any day and suddenly a book lands on your desk which tells you something wonderful that you absolutely have to include yep and you know that, that's hell <laughs> <laughs> yeah you you just described why the logistics make it that way um yeah so so finding everything and uh hitting hitting google hard I, i'm sure oh, at yeah, least in the modern day because they're, they're, libraries they're, especially with um with older works or with historic works on manga and anime, there are a lot of resources buried in other subject areas. 
Mm. Um, obviously, history of Japan is a major one if you're doing something historic, and you have to have to give yourself permission to go as deep as your schedule allows you. Now, there are some books where the publisher doesn't want that. You as the writer may want it, but the publisher doesn't want it. And then you can kind of decide how do we, deep do I need to go to make this valid? But, you know, I always like going a bit further. Yeah, you kind of have to go uh, a, a step past the line so you yeah. can know where that is. Um, so we're, we're about to wrap up here. I have some, some classic questions I have so far. Uh, I've established which Liege verse character are you? Oh, I'm not nearly tall enough to be anyone except <laughs> or maybe Mikun. Okay. <laughs> but if I could choose a character, I would definitely be Emeraldus. Mm. Absolutely, definitely. Yeah, great, great character, and uh, she's her own woman. Uh, she's always yeah. been a woman, and uh, she's also wicked with a sword, which I was in my younger days, and just very, very proud and honourable. She she is her own woman, but she's also willing to uh, love, and she's That's willing to you know honor the 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 man that she loved uh, in Totoro. Her own woman, and, yes. You know when when a woman like Emeraldus, who let's face it, could have pretty much anybody, <laughs> fixes on Totoro, you know that yeah. this is, this this is a man worth knowing. Yeah, I mean, that might be a little bit of a, a male fantasy of uh, Matsumoto on his own right, as uh, Totoro is a bit of a uh, surrogate for him in, in that universe. But yes, uh, a fantastic character. And and overall, how has the Liegeverse changed your life? I think by being a reaffirmation. One, one of the things that I believe in very strongly is that spiritually we have to constantly return to the great myths and the great legends that inspired us and that give us our values. And the Ladyverse, and, and, and in particular for me, Harlock, but for many people I know it will, will, will be other things, has reaffirmed the value of the great heroic myth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge believer in the great hero heroic myth, although I don't see it in quite Joseph Campbell's terms because I think the hero's journey is a bit too exclusionary and a bit too mm. privileged. But um, to me, being able to see in the modern age an example of the great heroic myth is an utterly wonderful thing, an utterly life-changing thing, and... That, I think, is where the Lady Verse has operated most of my life. Helen McCarthy, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been one of the more uh, most poignant interviews I've gotten to have. No offense to anybody I've talked to or will talk to, but this has been absolutely fantastic. Lieji Matsumoto, Essays on Manga and Anime Legend. Uh, are, is available for pre-order on Amazon. You will be able to find a link to that in the description wherever you're viewing this video. Please go pre-order it because it's it's going to be so important. You know, ask to get it in your local library, ask to get it in your college's library, because these things are going to help not just <laughs> Helen and, and the people who have contributed to the book, but it's going to impact the legacy of Lieji Matsumoto and future works that will be made about Lieji Matsumoto. So again, Helen, I thank you. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to send us off with here. Well, thank you. And, and again, definitely do talk to your college library, your school library, your public library, because libraries need support. Libraries love readers. And yes. if you go in there and tell them about a book that you really want, they will be so happy to engage with you. And the other thing is I'm so glad that you have Tim Eldred to look forward to and Darren mm -hmm. Ashford to look forward to because they are such, such great Matsumoto scholars with a totally different viewpoint to mine. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the fascinating thing about Matsumoto, isn't it? That, you know, this, this, this guy who was born in Japan during the last war, who for most of us is the age of our grandparents or older, can still do so much to touch our lives. Totally mm. different culture, totally different age group, totally different background, but he understands and he gets us. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. 
Absolutely. Thank you again. We went a bit over. So huge thanks to you, Helen McCarthy. And pre-order the book. Dang it. It's in the link description. Uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again someday. Wonderful. Thank you, Jacob. Oh, uh, real quick. A little cheesy. Would you mind giving us a Harlock salute to see us out? Oh, no. I wouldn't dream of it. I mean, he, he would probably feel it was quite... <laughs> Uh, offen- well, not offensive, but you probably feel it was quite inappropriate for a woman who wasn't military to do that. Oh, so goodness. with the greatest respect to the captain, I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Wow. Okay, that's the most poignant rejection I've had so far on the topic. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you to everybody. This has been Liegeverse, facebook.com slash Liegeverse. We'll see you again soon.